So Nigeria's power-hungry politicians, brimming with competition, continuing to engage in a testosterone contest over the leadership of the country. And that rivalry for supremacy leading predictably to a constant stream of belligerent words. Those who support the man who's presently in charge, President Bola Tinubu, describe his first 100 days in office in glowing terms as busy, focused, impressive and gratifying. The man is galloping ahead, they say, checking off on his promises and coming through on them one after the other. Billions of dollars in pledges of investment from India, meetings with the top leaders of the world at the G20 summit, including President Biden, and most recently negotiating the lifting of a visa ban imposed on Nigerians by the UAE. But the president's main detractors, namely the opposition PDP, say it's all a big spin that's riddled with misinformation and very little substance. So what exactly are they talking about here? Well, for more on this, I'm joined now from our studios in London by the lawyer, leading member of the PDP and spokesman of the Atiku presidential campaign, Daniel Buala, who I'm told is now also a PhD student. <laughs> Daniel, you wear so many hats, I'm never quite sure where to start. But let's just start from saying it's great to see you, old chap. Been a while, but lovely to have you Thank on you. the program. And if you don't mind my asking, what's your PhD in? Well, actually, thank you for having me on Good Evening. I'm actually doing a research uh, on anti-corruption. And uh, my case study for, this, uh, for the research is Nigeria. That has uh, afforded me the opportunity to interface with the relevant uh, uh, investigative and uh, anti-crime agencies around the world. Uh, so in the coming days, I'll probably give you more information about my findings and research, but basically that is what I am doing, all in the hope to see that I con uh, contribute my part to the development of the country, especially with respect to anti-corruption. Well, some would say that you couldn't have chosen a better country for your topic than Nigeria. But congratulations. I mean, that's another yeah. feather to your cap. But let's get to the meat and potatoes of our interview. Clearly, Rome wasn't built in a day. So fixing Nigeria is going to take uh, a while. But the president's supporters say he's off to a good start, citing his recent achievements with investors in India, sideline meetings with the world's top leaders at the G20 summit and the lifting of a visa ban imposed on Nigerians by the UAE, amongst many other things. I mean, surely that's all good news for Nigerians, but you say it's all a big spin. Tell us why you think so. Well, it would have been a good news if, for example, it is true. Unfortunately, it is not. Uh, it is said that we campaign in poetry, but we govern in prose. But it appears that they are still uh, governing in poetry. You see, uh, the 100 days of the administration of uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has been uneventful, in my opinion. And, and uh, like I said, I wish him well, but the pledge in Nigeria is as I pledge to Nigeria, my country, to be faithful, loyal, and honest. We have to be honest you know, with ourselves and honest to our leaders. And that is patriotic action, so that our leaders will learn from our opinions on the way they are governing us. Now, uh, what they have termed as achievement, quite frankly, can be seen by all as just exaggeration, over exaggeration of their perception of what they call the achievement. Because in the last 100 years, if you ask a Nigerian, a Nigerian, they will tell you that nothing has significantly changed in their lives. And you can look at every fabric of our society, I mean, our lives, sorry. If you look at education, there is nothing that has happened in the education sector. If you look at labor, for example, they are still having back and forth, try to negotiate basic salary and, and, and working conditions with uh, ASU and other trade unions. If you look at uh, health care, there is nothing that has happened, as a matter of fact. So they have now, because domestically there is nothing to show as a progressive uh, result of what they are doing, they have decided to embark on foreign trips, in other words, diplomacy, to see if they can curry 
the Pharaoh's uh, favor and accolades. You see, uh, there are two things I want to mention. The first one was the trip to India. And with the greatest respect, what I said can be verified. The trip to India was act basically a global picnic. The G20 usually is like a global picnic where G20 members come and deliberate on world issues. But if it is successful, there will be a joint statement stating exactly what they intend to do, what they have agreed on. Because of the absence of China and Russia, they haven't been able to come up with any clear-cut uh, direction on what to do. That's why the joint statement has been criticized by global leaders as watery. But that's even on one side. The president was invited as a member, and African Union celebrated the fact that they have been joined as permanent members. But it doesn't mean anything because the entire African Union has only one vote. So in other words, the rest of the country, two other countries can just wipe out whatever opinion African Union has. But the president of Nigeria left the country four days before the event for reasons uh, based known to him. Because I'm sure if there are vital and important issues in the country, there would have been no need for him to travel to India. And at the time he arrived in India, the president of India was not even in the country. But let's cut the long story short in that regard. He met with businessmen. He took along with him Nigerian invest, uh, investors or businessmen. And uh, from the report, and only one source will get the report, which is the media aid to the president, is that they secured victory, they secured promises, they secured billions, and they are just exaggerating and mentioning uh, you know, monies that could not be verified either by the investors themselves, either through a joint statement, through their website, or through their personal social media handle. And they were, it's just like when I come to do business with you and you say, I want to do this. But the intriguing fact about the investors is that they saw the domestic investors that were carried along to India. And they will be wondering because investors are not like people who work on the street. What they are advised before investing. They would have seen Nigerian businessmen that accompanied the president. And if you look around and study in the past four or five years, they have encountered their own losses. I remember not long ago, I saw an article by Atedola that he nearly committed suicide because of the losses he incurred. Dangote, and then you find a lot of them. And the Indian investors will be wondering that if you want me to invest in your country, there should be evidence that those who are already investing in the country are succeeding. Unfortunately, the foreign policy objective of this government is missed, applied. It is mixed, mixed uh, I don't know the better word to use, but to me, it does not carry any meaning. Because, you see, if as a father... You want somebody to marry your daughter and you carry her to a picnic. The evidence of the good things to come is that your daughter should look pretty, should look healthy, should look robust, should look like she has been fed, and then the suitors will be attracted. But when you carry your daughter to a picnic and she look unkept, she look hungry, she look disjointed, deplorable condition and despondent, there is no way you can attract the investors. Short of a long story with India is that everything they said they secured as investment plan or promises could only be established by themselves. There is no one word from any investor in India that they have actually committed to such. Then they took the trip again to Dubai. It is in Dubai that we saw the object of caricature. Because all you need to do is to look at the statement issued by the media aid to the president. And you will tell yourself that this is a national embarrassment. Well, this evening, because we called them out, they are trying to retract, backtrack, and they try to modify. One is that there was a meeting. It was a working visit. And what they agreed on was to discuss further and strengthen ties that will be of mutual benefit. You can see that in the official news agency website of the United Arab Emirates. There was no mention of an agreement for a visa restriction lifting. There was no mention of travel restriction lifting. There was no mention of specific dollars that they are going to put. And to further prove my point, just today, after the United Arab Emirates had agreed with Armenia in similar situation, the, the United Arab Emirates issued a statement specifically and in a clear terms that they, are, they have lifted certain restrictions with respect to travel to the people of Armenia. If such existed in the meeting yesterday, it would have been published in the website. Some international new media has felt even embarrassed because the media had blasted the news across all platforms around the world. And they reported, when you check Bloomberg and CNN and all other news outlets, you will see that their source is only one, unverified. Later in the evening, the media aid went to a TV station and tried to walk back 
by saying that, well, it is not immediate. Well, it is they are going to fine tune the details. The details which he said, they stayed back to fine tune. After the meeting, they started, you know, moving their way. Right. Well, to Daniel, me, I'm just going to come in that there. That is not the way to govern. Right. I'm just going to come in there because you've made a lot of very um, illuminating points there. First of all, let me just take, and I'm not a spokesman for the government, obviously, but they're not here to defend themselves. So I'm just going to take the first thing, one of the things that you talked about, which is um, Dan Gote and uh, the other people who accompanied the president as sort of big business people and investors in Nigeria, ostensibly to go abroad and help convince other business people that it's worth investing in Nigeria. I mean, you, you may, have the, may have a point in saying that it's not all ship shape and sea worthy, but I mean, Dangote is the richest man in Africa. He's been that consistently, and, and most of his wealth has come from what he's been doing in Nigeria. So there's an argument to be made for that, as well as some of the other people who run some of the biggest companies that, are, that go beyond Nigeria uh, across the rest of Africa and also on the issue of visas. I mean, the, everybody reported it, and you're right in saying that the source was always the president's spokesman, that, you know, that's where it, it came from and, and from no one else, including the BBC and all the rest of them. But the fact remains, and I don't, I mean, I haven't seen the website that you're talking about. You may well have a plausible point there, but the fact remains that those usually in these circumstances um, it is always a first step and one side in, in those negotiations tend to be given the chance. I mean often you see it with the US and some other people. Somebody else is given that opportunity to make the announcement because they want to get publicity, some kind of publicity capital from it. Now I'm not disputing, I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong, I'm simply saying that in the context of international relations, that is the way things tend to happen. But let me turn to another point that you mentioned in your very interesting tweet uh, earlier, which is the picture of Mr. Tinubu that they released that you said was about meeting Mr. Biden. Um, but according to you, beyond that han handshake that we saw, there was no sideline meeting. Would you care to sort of enlighten us more? Right, I will do that. But permit me to clear one point that you mentioned. You see, when there is a meeting of two countries or two counterparts, once the resolution is done, usually there is a joint statement. In the event there is no joint statement and there is going to be individual statement, there will be corroborative statement. It means the government of Nigeria will be able to address the press there about what they agreed on and then the government of the United Arab Emirates will confirm either directly in, or separately. But as it stands today, it is only Nigeria version. There is no word from the United Arab Emirates that corroborated that point, other than the fact that they have agreed to deepen ties to look at uh, issues that were has uh, in, that's of common uh, interest. You're asking them to come and invest in Nigeria when they can't even recoup the one they've invested through their airline. That's one. With respect to, uh, so it applies to India. With respect to the businessmen, I talk about fact-based information. Over the last eight years of APC administration, you can check it, or anybody listening tonight can check. Dangote has lost not less than $5 billion. And you can run that through all the businessmen in Nigeria. Well, they will try to say pandemic, whatever, they will give excuse. But Nigerian investors, domestic investors, even with all the leverages they get in terms of tax holidays, still they have not been able to break the jig because our local laws, the private sector has not been given the thriving environment. And so what it means is that the president should stay and develop the house, and then investors will find it attractive. With respect to uh, the meeting in, uh, uh, in India, U U.S. Biden cannot, when it is not pre-arranged, that... Uh, it, it looks like we're, we're having a bit of a connection problem. Um, you, uh, stay with us, of course, because uh, I'm presuming that uh, the internet connection is going to write itself in a moment. Um, Daniel Buala there talking about that ostensible meeting between President Biden and uh, President Tirubo. And Daniel, you're back online, so please continue from where you left off. Right. So I'm saying that I'll give you an instance of the point I'm trying to buttress. 
you you have it, Richie Sunak was in India was in India. He was billed to meet Prime Minister Modi, but because that day was arranged for Modi to meet with Joe Biden, even though he made effort to meet the man, he could not. He had to meet him the next day. That's diplomatic protocol. And as far as we know, there was no plan for President Biden to meet with uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu at the G20. So when they met, they shook hands. It was just, just the shaking of hands after they visited one of the Hindu sites or whatever. So there was no site. The point I'm trying to make is that the media machine of the president is projecting itself as awful and even worse than the previous administration. Because in the previous administration, they will give the information as it were, but they, they are not forceful in making the argument. In this one, they are forceful in the communication of misinformation, forceful in their misleading of the Nigerian people. And you often hear them say, we try as much as possible to be honest with Nigeria. It's not a big deal to meet this president. But don't make a, a mountain out of a molehill. Don't make it seem like photo ops and shaking of hands will amount to foreign investments as they are trying to project. By next week, when the president of Nigeria will meet President Biden based on protocol, that is when you can talk about sidelines. In fact, I told myself, if the G20 meeting and the Dubai, they try to make a whole caricature of our territorial integrity, by next week when they will meet with a lot of presidents, either in hallway, in escalators, in sidelines, in meetings like that, I am only imagining what they will be projecting. They will probably say the entire United Nations have planned to come and invest in Nigeria. All I'm trying to say in, in essence is that you can only develop and make your country attractive when you focus on your domestic policies on national security interests and national interests of the country. Now, it is containing your manifesto. You have abandoned that and you're on a foreign trip to use photo ops as evidence of either legitimacy or evidence of prosperity. That cannot work. Mark what I'm saying, and I'll be happy to come back to your studio. In the next one year, you will see nothing from Dubai as per investment. You will see nothing from India as per investment because they are just photo ops and statements. There are no specificity, there are no deliverables, and there are no timelines. So this is the point we are trying to say. Focus on insecurity in the country. Okay, look at the National Security Advisor. He's like an elder brother or uncle to me. National Security Advisor is in every meeting of this government. Political meeting, uh, but, 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 oh, meetings that have nothing to do with national security. <laughs> well, now, you, you, make some, you make some really good points. Right. You make some very interesting points, Daniel. I suppose time will tell. Um, we'll have to wait and see whether um, all the investment um, pledges that they talked about, because, I mean, obviously, when it's a pledge, it means that somebody pledges to invest in your country contingent on certain other things that if you do them, we will then invest. I mean, but we'll have to wait and see. But listening to you talk, I mean, you're obviously, as always, a very articulate person. I'm wondering if the leaders of the PDP um, should perhaps now stop in their tracks and turn their public service focus away from or the legal protest to the role of the official opposition, which is what you're doing, which is to question and scrutinize the work of the government, sort of like what you're doing, as I said, in the program today. I mean, would that be the best way to be a safeguard against the excesses of empowered Nigerian politicians? Oh, yeah. First of all, uh, as far as the legal framework of the country is concerned, until there is a final determination of the subject of election petition by the Supreme Court, there is nothing you can do to stop the PDP, for example, from challenging that. But that does not mean that because we are in court, we cannot engage the ruling government and provide alternatives. We don't hate them, but that's how democracy works. We All of us cannot come and be saying, boy, so ye. Our duty to Nigeria, like I told you about the pledge, is to interrogate the government. Unfortunately, the signs I'm seeing as this government is taking up is going to be worse than the previous administration unless there is a retracing of the step and change of strategy. You must leave propaganda and then work with realities. That's one. Number two, the governing party, they are using every conceivable strategy under the heaven to use certain individuals in PDP and with the hope that they will weaken PDP 
and probably turn the country into a one-party state. If you have seen, over the last few months, they have instigated and orchestrated the suspension of national chairmen of almost every political party. In fact, recently they even got to sack, can you imagine, the presidential candidate of NNPP. And unfortunately, we have in our party a, a, an individual who believes he's God. And he is romancing with them and presenting himself as a worthy candidate that can be used to destroy PDP so they can have a one-party state. Unfortunately, when PDP was being formed, he was nowhere near the ideology of the party. So PDP will survive, PDP will try, and PDP will remodel this country in no distant time. We need a country that works. We want a country that works. We don't want to build a country on propaganda and rhetorics. There are fundamental things confronting us as a country. They have been domesticated into the various manifestos during the campaign. They've thrown away the manifesto. We need you to begin to implement the manifesto so we can interrogate you and say, okay, this is, for example, when they remove first subsidy, we told them we all agree that subsidy will be removed, but in our own plan, we said it should be in phases and that you will do it in such a manner that the impact on the masses will not be much. In their own case, it was just one statement like that. They removed it. How much is one dollar to a naira? How much is pound to a naira? Do you know any parent that paid the school fees of their children in all foreign schools this year, they pay twice the value, not occasioned by the foreign schools, but by the, uh, by, by, by the incoherent policies of the government. So if, for example, the pound sterling was 21,000 pounds, as at the time that student registered last year, because last year the, foreign, the forex policy is that students can access the pounds a certain amount, which is about 500 and something. Now the person is required to pay over 220 percent just that kind of policy that can throw people into derision what do we talk about investors look at what they when they gave out the five billion to states and they say it's palliative they just turn the country into internally displaced you know places you know like like refugee camp have you seen the footage of how these palliatives have been delivered the dignity of the human person has been thrown. We are not even talking about whether it is actually delivered to the people and how many of them. So, well, so some would your manifesto so we can challenge you on that. Right. Well, but some, some it seems now it is just as the spirit leads. Right. I mean, uh, I'm not in any way, as I said, holding um, forth for the, for the APC. But some would question whether the the PDP was any difference during its its years in office but what, what i'd like to ask you though daniel is i mean you you talked about the fact that a leading member of the pdp is now essentially in bed with the apc at, on a ministerial level i mean i wonder what the mood is inside the pdp today i understand you're marking 25 years i mean you've got one of your leading members, Nyesem Wike, now openly working for the APC government. And I imagine that the ruling by the presidential election tribunal must have recreated that sort of vast sense of loss and, and effusive despair that the PDP first experienced when Einek announced the winner of the election earlier this year. No, the judgment of the court has even created more questions than answers. For example, after the judgment, now the natives of the FCT are planning to approach the court. Since the court of law, the election petition court said Abuja is just like every other state, the natives now say, okay, we want to approach the court and get an order of court mandating federal government to let us have our governor and three senators without prejudice to other peculiarities that is associated with state. And they are now saying they are even going to seek for an order restraining the FCT minister from parading himself as FC, FCT minister pending the determination of the suit. It has, there are so many other areas that this judgment has created. So now you need virtually on every part of the constitution, you need to go to court to get interpretation. Because it seems we're getting into a new legal order in that regard. Now, but the, the, the person... If he feels emboldened, for example, by that judgment, one fact I have to make clear is that the party has survived a lot of hurdles, and the party will survive him. And very soon, he's going to be expelled from the party because he has violated the provisions of the party's constitution that will warrant his expulsion. It's just that the party is taking its time and taking it gently. 
he recently he even got the audacity to say he wants to suspend the presidential candidate of the party. When Atiku Abubakar with the founding father sat and they were forming this party, where was he? He was working in National Union Road Transport or something in Port Harcourt under Azubike Meremi. And then you want to now challenge somebody who, who is like the, one of the bastions of democracy in the country. The living politicians today in Nigeria that can beat their chest with living credentials are people like Atiku. Then you can talk about President Tinubu, people who work for democracy. This young man came into government in 1998, became a beneficiary. Everything he has, everything he acquired, and everything he is, it is the party. He owes the party gratitude and not this kind of attitude that he is given. To him, uh, Benjamin Franklin is everything. Or to him, he has the power. Now he's FCT minister. He can exercise this power against the party. One fact is clear. Even the president of Nigeria cannot destroy PDP. Not to talk of a civilian who is in uh, FCT minister thinking in his mind that he's going to destroy the party so we can have a one-party state. No, Tinibu does not support that. And let me tell you this. If Atiku picks his phone and calls President Tinibu and demands that Wike be sacked, Wike will be sacked before they will finish talking on the phone. That is the extent to which President Tinibu values and respects Atiku. So what he is doing in the FCT and all these melodramatic and emotional exegesis, he's only dancing before he'll be fired in the FCT. And he will not in any way affect the party. I give that word and you can look at it. Most of the people, you see, there is this thing called blackmail. And he has done that in the past. We are anybody who goes against him, he will call for a world press conference and he will say, I gave him this, I made him this, I gave him this. There are lots of them he chased out of the party. I remember he once boasted that Dave Umahi, when he left, that look at him. Am I not the one that got judgment for him? He let him interpret to Nigeria what he meant by I got judgment for him. Is yeah, let me, let me come in there like because we're, 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 we're fast running out of time. Let me come in there and I need to ask you a couple of other things. I mean, just listening to you talk and as very passionate as always um, and, you know, this, this being a kind of internecine tiff within the PDP that's being played out in public, um, it just gives the impression that the opposition is frankly looking a bit frayed at the edges. But you also talked about um, the fact that you're oh, clearly going to the Supreme Court. I mean, you're a lawyer, Daniel, and a lawyer of some repute. What is the most important weapon that you would say the PDP have in their armory going to the Supreme Court? Well, I don't want to preempt what the legal team will do at the Supreme Court. I deliberately refuse to offer my opinion on the judgment of the court to many uh, television stations within the country and outside of the country the day the judgment was delivered. It is deliberate because I want to read the judgment myself in detail and appreciate the reasoning of the court so I can offer my opinion. And I have to say that the judgment of court is binding on all authorities in the Federation. But the bindingness of the judgment of the court does not take away the constitutional right of Nigerians to give their opinion as to whether they agree with the judgment or not. I happen to disagree with the reasoning of their lordships. And I will only tell you one tonight which is section 134 sub 2, the requirement of 25% within the FCT. And in every ramification, you can look at that. If you say that FCT is just like any other state, that means just like does not mean it is. That's number one. But let's even push it further to say you meant it is like all the other states. What are the characteristics and the peculiarities of a state within the framework of our constitution? A state has an elective or executive officer called the governor. FCT does not have. A state has National Assembly people as required by constitution, three senators, and then the House of Rep as determined by the you know, delineation population and all of that. FCT does not have the same proportion, even though FCT is even larger than, uh, what do you call it, by ELSA. And then three, the constitution of Nigeria in section 299 says it is the president and National Assembly that administer the FCT. A state is not administered by the president and National Assembly. We can go on and on and on to suggest to you that FCT constitutionally was designed
to have specific and special role so that whoever will become president must have popularity in the seat of power. But the court thought otherwise. But we have judgment of the Supreme Court in the past that made clear as regarding the requirement. So it is good that it will be tested at the Supreme Court because the court that delivered the judgment right now is not the final court. And so right. judgment is not a final a judgment until it is determined by okay. the final court. Daniel, I want to thank you very much indeed. It's always a delight listening to you do your analysis of Nigeria as robustly as you usually do. Daniel Buwala is a lawyer, leading member of the PDP and spokesman of the Atiku presidential campaign, and is also now doing his PhD, um, focusing his research on corruption in Nigeria. And he was talking to me there from our studios in London.